everyone. So welcome to this uh, session on uh, on balancing market. We will have uh, three papers uh, this morning uh, that we we will uh, we will discuss um, uh, consequently and all together. As we have one hour and uh, forty five minutes for three papers, uh, we will be uh, with. Uh, enough time to, to present and to discuss. So um, let's start with the, the first presentation and uh, a presentation of a maximum of 20 minutes to uh, allow uh, discussions. And, uh, and then we will uh, raise uh, uh, questions and comments after the, the first presentation, then move to the second, then move to the third, uh, and the Q&A will be after uh, each of the sessions. So please, uh, Carlis, the, the floor is yours. You could upload your presentation. I hope everyone sees it now. Yes, great. Hi. So, yes. So I am Carlos Balputnis from the Institute of Power Engineering of Riga Technical University. And I'm, I'm going to present a study I'm currently working on together with Tim Shitekat and Zane Broca. The working title of it is Independent Aggregation in the Nordic Day Ahead Market, Potential Impact of Different Supplier Compensation Mechanisms. So let's start with the motivation for this line of research. The electricity directive mandates European Union member states to enable the participation of demand response via independent aggregators in all organized electricity markets. Independent aggregators being market participants engage in aggregation, but who are not affiliated to the customer supplier. Whereas uh, all organized electricity markets indeed include all markets. So balancing wholesale markets such as they had intraday, etc. However, the directive also allows requiring the aggregators to pay financial compensation to other market parties negatively affected by demand response activation. For instance, the suppliers who have in fact purchased the energy the independent aggregators are marketing. As shown by Shitikat et al, most member states, which by now do have an independent, frame, independent aggregator framework in place, or which, which soon will have such a framework, um, they, they either have implemented or are looking at implementing a compensation mechanism. However, as per the directive, the compensation should not create a barrier for flexibility, and it may take into account the benefits brought by independent aggregators to other market participants. So looking into the literature on this topic, we can find that independent aggregator participation in wholesale markets can lead to welfare improvements compared to when consumers are subject to a flat retail rate. Moreover, the increased competition can lead to wholesale price reduction and a shift, from, uh, a shift of producer surplus to consumer surplus. However, if the independent aggregators are not required to compensate for the energy sourcing costs, uh, that can potentially lead to welfare reduction due to excessive demand response, as shown by Hong Kong Chao. Moreover, as argued by William Hogan, the net effect of wholesale price reduction by uncompensated demand response could be an increase in payments through the capacity mechanisms, potentially dollar for dollar, for dollar at least in the long run. So, with this in mind, we wanted to see what could be the effect of subjecting or not subjecting independent aggregators to compensation for the activated demand response, particularly in the Nordic day ahead market context. The Nordic day ahead market is peculiar in that the vast majority of the physical electricity trade in this region is conducted there. For instance, in 2018, the ratio of the traded day ahead volume and the total consumption was 93.3% um, in the Nordics. Uh, so to, to perform our study, we use the actual hourly aggregated supply and demand curves published by Nordpool, limiting ourselves to one full year, 2018. The curves in their original form enable the calculation of the Nordic system price. However, we can estimate the potential impacts of demand response sold by independent aggregators 
by appending the supply curve uh, to include independent aggregator offers uh, subject to assumptions. Uh, this actual market curve-based approach is in principle similar to other studies where their head curves have been used to estimate the impact of wind, PV, and load shifting on their head price. Some, some recent examples of this being papers by Roldan uh, Fernandez and Argo Vargas, although they are focused on the actual aggregated uh, supply and demand curves from the Iberian their head market. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have the supply and demand bits per, uh, per bidding areas. We only have from the whole Nordic region. Hence, we have to limit ourselves to estimating the system price. Nevertheless, in some areas, especially in Norway and Sweden, the system price was very well correlated to the area prices in the time span considered. So this is the year 2018. And we can see that, for instance, uh, for, for, for Sweden and Norway, the correlation to system price was above 0.95, and, and, and it's the least in Finland and Denmark, respectively from 0.75 to 0.8. Uh, now, a quick note regarding the quality of the data and the curve intersection algorithm employed. We ran the whole year 2018 to see if we can replicate the actual prices. Uh, so uh, finding the intersection point between the uh, supply and demand curves and uh, seeing if, it, if, if the intersection point, point actually corresponds to the, uh, to the published uh, System, the actual published system price. So for 98.56% of the hours, the error that we, uh, the error of the price that we calculate uh, compared to the actual price does not exceed two cents per megawatt hour. Moreover, most of the notable errors occurred with data from two particular days, January one and two, which shows that the issue there was rather with the data in these, in these particular days rather than to the way we handled the data especially since there were no uh, any sort of outlier prices in, in these days, they were very, very unpaired to the rest of the year. Moving on to the setup for the calculations, uh, we have two key assumptions. For the time being, only road redu uh, load reducing demand response is considered, but more importantly, we assume that price changes due to, due to demand response via independent aggregation are not corrected by free entry. We test different shapes and parameters of independent aggregator demand response curves. The benchmark is a situation without independent aggregators in the day ahead market and the demand response consumers paying a flat rate. The studied alternatives, however, see the demand response consumers participating in the day ahead market via independent aggregators. With a compensation payment, the independent aggregators are subjected to uh, equal to the flat rate and socialized from to a, to a varying degree from zero to 100%. Uh, consequently, the benefits are estimated by comparing the alternatives to the benchmark. So the main metrics to be evaluated are the changes in producer and consumer surplus, which are calculated from the, uh, from the, from the aggregated market curves. So, so we calculate the surplus with actual curves and we calculate them with our appended supply curve with independent aggregation offers and we see the difference in producer surplus and consumer surplus. Uh, another metric of interest is the socialized compensation payments. Uh, in those alternatives where there was uh, some, some degree of compensation socialization. Okay. We look at the impact on the independent aggregator demand response consumer welfare. So focusing on, on uh, particularly on those consumers which are under independent aggregators. In the benchmark case, the potential demand response consumers experience over or under consumption uh, whenever the market price is respectively above or below their flat rate. However, in the alternatives with compensation socialized above 0%, inevitably under consumption is induced, which is ultimately uh, a net negative effect on the, on the demand response consumer because he's over incentivized to decrease his consumption below the effective level. So to get the overall net welfare impact, we sum these metrics together and express them per unit of energy basis, uh, specifically relative to the total market clearing volume. So this is done so that the results are better comparable. We can also look solely at the net consumer welfare impact 
uh, by discarding the change in producer surplus. So, so we can look at uh, two things. One is the sum of all these four components. <clears throat> and another one is the sum of those uh, components that deal with the consumer uh, from the consumer's perspective. Uh, there's a number of other assumptions. The most important probably being uh, that the compensation price is set equal to the original average day ahead price from 10, 2018, which was 43.99 euro megawatt hour. Uh, other assumptions are that independent aggregators know in advance the compensation rules, so including also the price, <clears throat> and thereby they can price that in their bids to the market. Uh, moreover, all calculations are based on the system price, disregarding that in reality it could vary between the Nordic bidding areas. Um, the aggregators are assumed to be operating in the day ahead market situation as it was in 2018, so we don't really look at future projections. And the uh, last uh, one is that the, all the Nordic countries are treated as one region with equal independent aggregator rules. So, so they have equal competition price, equal socialization, etc. Um, in terms of the demand response, uh, considered we assumed three different scenarios of what the independent aggregator demand response activation cost curves could look, look like. One of them is uniform, uh, the, the one in the middle, the blue one. Another is called expensive, the orange one, and it has most of the reduction volume at a high activation cost range. And the last one, the, the gray, is the cheap curve, which has most of the volume at the low cost range. And now let's look at the results when we vary the compensation socialization from zero to 100% with a step of 5%. Uh, this is a reminder of the four net benefit components considered and how they add up. Uh, the increase in consumer surplus is the main positive component here uh, colored in orange. Uh, producer surplus is, is uh, similar, so, uh, somewhat similar in volume, but negative. But we can see that with increased socialization, the negative effects of the socialized compensation and the demand response over over incentivization uh, start to amass and add up. Uh, now, in, in this chart, uh, we can see how, uh, uh, how how the how the price can be affected in the individual hours considering the compensation. And indeed, the greatest price reductions can be achieved when the original price is the highest, as could be expected. Uh, so we have on the horizontal axis, the original market price, and the on the vertical axis, the uh, price reduction, sums compensation. Uh, however, we, we can see that indeed the better effect is when the original price is very high. Uh, however, in the particular data set used, there are very few hours with high prices. There were, as we can see, uh, only some four or five hours above 100 uh, euros per megawatt hour. Uh, on the other hand, when the original price is in the medium range, we can arrive at situations when the socialized compensations actually overshadow the wholesale price reduction, leading to a net negative impact. It's very hard to see in this in this figure, but uh, but uh, some some of the points are below the uh, zero zero line. Actually, it's it's a considerable number of points just because of the density, it's really hard to see. So uh, this figure shows the amount of demand response sold by independent aggregators depending on the original market price. The main takeaway here is how very reduced the independent aggregator activity becomes if the compensation is not socialized. So here with the green colored dots, we have a situation where the independent aggregator does not have to pay compensation because it's fully socialized. And with the yellow dots, we have where it has to pay full compensation. And we can see that its activity or, or expressed in, in how much uh, volume it is able to sell in each hour is, is significantly reduced then. Now, let's again look at the sum results. On the left side, we can see that only at no or very low compensation socialization, the overall net welfare is positive. Uh, and as we increase the socialization, the overall net uh, welfare benefit goes increasingly negative. At the same time, on the right side, the profitability of the independent aggregators keeps increasing despite co causing this negative overall effect. However, if you look at the issue strictly from the consumer's point of view, so looking at the net consumer welfare benefit, we can see that it is not negative with either of these three demand response curves considered. 
and uh, the, this consumer benefit is highest at about the medium level of socialization. Uh, so on the x-axis, we have the level of socialization. However, we can also see that it moves to the left with, uh, with more expensive demand response assumptions. Importantly, the independent aggregators do need the demand response activation costs to be low to medium. Otherwise, their business case is very limited, regardless of socialization, which can be, which can be seen in the orange line on the right figure, which is uh, barely above the, the zero, zero axis, even for the expensive uh, activation cost case. <clears throat> Finally, we add one more scenario whereby the demand response activation cost is exactly equal to the compensation price. So this is not a multi-step curve. This is a curve where there's only one price uh, uh, volume of price quantity pair. And uh, now we do see a negative net benefit also from the consumer's perspective. However, that measures at socialization greater than about uh, 80, sorry, 90, 95%. So looking at the issue uh, using these simple curves, which only have one value of uh, price quantity pair, uh, we, can, uh, we can explore the sensitivities of the results. So we rerun the calculations with a number of such simple curves with combinations uh, from within ranges of the demand response maximum bid volumes and activation prices. So these are activated, uh, sorry, uh, varied the volumes from zero to 2.5 gigawatt hours per hour maximum and the activation prices vary from five to 60 euros per megawatt hour uh, with a step of five euros. So the results are fairly similar to the multi-step demand response cases. We saw before the overall net welfare benefit is, uh, is positive, about very minuscule, only at no or very low socialization. And otherwise it is, uh, it is uh, is negative and most negative at about medium demand response activation costs as we can see in the third figure. Uh, so here on the axis we have the activation costs. And looking from the consumer perspective, the net consumer benefit is again positive, but with caveats, with sufficiently high uh, maximum demand response volumes and activation costs in the medium range, we do arrive at negative impact on consumers at high socialization levels. So here in the third figure where the share of compensation socialized is 100%, we see that a lot of the lines uh, go, go to, the, to the negative region of the chart. And each of these lines is a different uh, maximum demand response volume per hour. And uh, these lines that go negative are, are those where the volume is higher. Of course, the results presented need to be considered in context of the data set employed and limitations of the methodology. Arguably the most important of them being limiting the study scope to the system price and thereby disregarding the larger price volatility in some of the Nordic bidding areas. And secondly, we assume that the bids of other market participants do not change. So, so it's as if they don't really react to the uh, emergence of independent aggregators. Some other, some other limitations are that the net flows with other areas remain unaffected uh, as do the block bids. Another limitation is this data-driven approach is limited to historical market situation, so we don't look into the future cases when price volatility could be higher. And another thing is that we don't really look at uh, things like baselining and other practical independent aggregator implementation issues, which could potentially maybe change the way that independent aggregators bid in the market. And uh, moving on to the conclusions, nevertheless, these preliminary results show that even despite the strong assumption that demand response activity not corrected by free entry, socialization of the compensation creates an overall negative effect on the uh, total welfare compared, compared to the benchmark. Uh, however, from the consumer's perspective, the independent aggregator activities in the day ahead market do bring benefits. Still, however, over incentivizing independent aggregators can lead to consumer benefit reductions in certain conditions, even creating negative overall benefit, benefit to them. At the same time, under requirement to pay full compensation, the business case of independent aggregators in the studied day ahead market is questionable. That is, more price volatility would likely be required. In the near future, the current study will be extended to also consider load increasing demand response participating in the day ahead market 
with independent aggregators. So that's roughly all from me. In this slide, you can, you can see the literature that is referred to in this presentation. So in, in case you want to look up any, any, any more details, here also included are two papers that are currently in press, one by my co-author, Tim, who, who took stock of the regulatory framework for independence aggregators. Another one is by me and my colleague, uh, Zane Broca, whereby we, we make the first steps towards using the, these aggregated uh, bidding curves in estimating potential price reductions. Uh, thank you. I am open for questions. Thank you, Carlis, uh, Tim, and Zan, because I think you are all in the in the room, so that's uh, that's nice of you to to be here. Um, well, is there some uh, questions or comment, comments coming from uh, from the audience? As we are not very uh, a large number of people, you just have to switch on your your camera and raise your question uh, uh, on the free on the free way. Okay, so uh, maybe I will. Uh, uh -huh, have a question, uh, Javier? Yes. Uh, so thank you very much for the presentation. It's a very interesting topic. Can you explain again how you calculate the consumer surplus? Because uh, I don't know if there is a price cap, but uh, the, the uh, demand curve becomes uh, perfectly inelastic at some point in electricity markets. So consumer surplus is infinite empirically. So how, how do you calculate consumer surplus? Right, so uh, ultimately what we are interested in is the change in the consumer surplus. So, so to calculate the, uh, the before and after consumer surplus, we just basically draw the line to the y-axis to, to be able to, to get the area to integrate. But since we only care for the difference that, that, that we can get from that, Right, right. Thank you. Uh, you have also a question from Xenia. Hello. Uh, thanks, Carlos, for the very interesting presentation. I was actually uh, uh, quite intrigued by the uh, very first statement that um, you quoted by um, some of the American authors saying that, um, uh, let's say, no compensation uh, would lead to excessive demand response. So um, I actually have several comments slash questions in this context. A, um, as, um, as we know in the US where exactly those researchers come from, they would uh, only allow aggregation of demand response but not aggregation of uh, generation units. So I think this is also an important thing to consider for the, uh, let's say, European case, since in, in Europe, as far as I know, most aggregators do not purely aggregate demand response, but always have um, other uh, units that are on the supply side. So I wonder how, how easy or even feasible it is to disaggregate, um, let's say demand response activities from the uh, supply and demand curves in the European context. So that would be point one. Um, and also um, a comment to that, then that would also mean that both, if an independent aggregator has such a mixed portfolio in most cases, then both supplier uh, surplus and consumer surplus would be affected. So it's not necessarily only, um, it's not necessarily this one-sided as in the US. And the second um, question is, what do you estimate would be an additional effect on the um, independent aggregators activities and those uh, results that you presented if you would um, also consider uh, network tariffs in your, um, in your analysis? Because that specifically uh, for the consumer side is, a, is a, um, also a high impact factor. Um, that guides their decision to participate in demand response in the first place. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the comments. Uh, so on the on the first point uh, on uh, on uh, looking at the uh, independent aggregator operation, the the cons consumption aggregation separately from potentially pulling that together with supply. Uh, uh, yeah, I I agree that uh, we might see 
perhaps even quite different results if we if you also consider that possibility. Uh, although I'm not sure I can really I can really es estimate without doing the actual calculations and or, or looking at the theory on uh, how that could look like. Uh, yes, maybe maybe Tim, do you have any comments regarding this? Um, yes, thank you, Xenia. I didn't expect anything else than very difficult questions. I think uh, you, you are very right about this mixed portfolio because then what we do now does not work really because we are only assuming that they are consumers. Um, but would, would generators, okay, if you're really talking about like let's say medium sized generators, uh, medium voltage, whatever, would they be used using independent aggregator? Do they still have some sort of, mm, not so I mean, yeah, probably we I have to say write. Absolutely, yeah. um, because I'm right now involved in several projects where aggregators are involved. Um, okay, that is with the premise that these are national projects, but uh, some of them were, extremely convinced of their of their position and saying without us they would not be on the market at all because we are the ones who are saving them an immense let's say administrative cost everything when it comes to um on the one hand balancing responsibility and all that electricity market expertise that they um often do not really possess to the same extent um, but does the compensation issue exist for these generators because for consumers the whole point is that the supplier supposedly bought some energy for them and then they play with that energy even though they never paid for it. But for mm -hmm. a generator, there is not that, that issue. They, they don't have right. to compensate anything. So therefore, yeah, maybe you the... can just let it go. I'm not sure whether you can let it go so easily because think about it. It's a, uh, it gets really, why am I bringing, I'm bringing it up because I really find it really tricky for analysis because this case gets, let's say muddied really fast because on the one hand you have uh, the consumers that uh, very often would always have also have their self-generating units. So there, of course, then you have to consider, okay, what is the amount of electricity that I actually produce myself? And after that, I'm commercializing it through an independent aggregator. And what would be the amount that uh, I, um, I get from the supplier first? And after that, try to you know sell it back when I don't need it. Um, so you have this level of complexity that you also have to distinguish um, because, yeah, very often it is not pure demand, right? You have some self-generating units. And with the generation, they might, the question of uh, socialization might not be as applicable to them, but since they're in the same portfolio of the independent aggregator, it is indirectly also has an impact. So... I don't think you can just uh, so easily disregard it. And as I was uh, saying at the beginning, um, it's hard to, uh, let's say, transfer the, uh, the uh, conclusions made by uh, uh, American fellow researchers um, to the European context. In fact, yeah. uh, there is an easy way to get out from this trap, uh, Tim and... Um... It is to say that you need to, to make a typology of the aggregators first, because you have demand response aggregators, mm -hmm. you have storage aggregators, and you mm -hmm. have um, producers uh, that could uh, have flexible production, and then you have crossovers. <laughs> Uh, and in France, I could give you names of, uh, of aggregators. Voltalis would be one that works Voltalis in our case. Be on, on the yeah. demand side, uh, Total Flex will be uh, a mix of everything. And, uh, and uh, Smart Grid Energy uh, would be uh, only uh, com combining demand response and uh, flexible generation. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you enter the, pro the problem saying, okay, there is three or four types of uh, uh, aggregators. Uh, the US type aggregator on the one hand provide this type of results. Uh, the storage uh, aggregators on the other hand produce something that it's one time, well, let's say 50% of the time like in the US and 50% of the time different from the US because there are generators, that, uh, they can be generators. And there is also uh, the, 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 the other opposite which is 100% gener flexible generators that would mm. enter the market. 
market. Then you could say, okay, we have three case studies and we can try to capture three, uh, let's say, um, typological impacts and reality will be fixed in, <laughs> uh, in between these three, these three zones. Then you keep your results on the, the US type and you, you try to, to come up with intermediate scenarios for uh, uh, storage and uh, uh, generation flexibility. Yeah, I think it's a very good idea. And what also works is that, okay, this issue is more important, let's say, with the demand response aggregator, with the full consumption case. Yeah. Mm. And you show why it is important to look at your topic, because if it's demand response, it's a, a really a game changer and it disturbs more than it's if it's flex from uh, uh, from producers yeah. or from storage providers. Because I mean, this point really touches upon one of the issues that we have been mostly, let's say, challenged with, is the fact that we use day ahead supply and demand curves. While actually, if you look, for example, in Belgium, Netherlands, uh, France, this is only what 10, 15, 20, 25 percent of like physical mm. consumption where it goes. So actually what you have on the sides of these curves, it's not demand and supply. It's uh, whatever market player is adjusting mm. his portfolio. Yep. But the Nordics is a kind of a special case where you have almost 100 percent going through the day ahead. Where for this is maybe not too crazy to assume what we did. On the other hand, it's also not perfect. Uh, and, and therefore, we had to look for these additional studies, which do the same thing in the Spanish case, where you had this also something like almost kind of, it was not mandatory, but where also you have a big volume going through the day ahead market, because otherwise you simply cannot do it. And again, in the US, it's, it's, they can do it because it's really supply and demand on one thing, and then they do their kind of, uh, what is it, constrained optimal dispatch. So that's, and it's, it's exactly the same uh, difficulty as the question of Xenia, but we never looked at her difficulty uh, or we never thought about it while, while it's the same problem. Like, do you really have demand and, and generation at, at the sides of the supply and demand curves that we use? Because otherwise you, you cannot do what we do. So it's- Another uh, way to, to get out from, from the trap would, would be to say that uh, if you are a, a, a let's say a product, a producer and a consumer demand response. Uh, in fact, you run your personal market. Hmm. You, you do your optimization as offer and mm -hmm. demand and you, you finalize your product on the market. But in fact, you run a sub market because you are looking at your cost, the price coming from elsewhere, your demand curve, your offer curve, you make your optimization and then you provide the results to where it values the most. Yeah, because uh, similar also, I mean, an extension would be to, to really do a sort of a simulation where, where you do a sort of, a, let's say, um, a unit commitment, and then you don't have that kind of issue. Like, but I mean, we, Carly's had a, the great data set and, and then thought, okay, let's, let's, let's see what happens when you have this compensation or not. And, and that's a kind of a thing we try to do uh, with, of course, the, the difficulties in, in the data and can you really do that? It's, it's a bit the uh, engineering style uh, applied on, on an economic problem. So we just have to not fall in some traps and it's good that you already lay out some of these, these traps and ways out. Yeah, thank well, you for that. Um, we have to move to the next presentation, but just my final remark, uh, take care when you select one year over multiple years, you have to qualify this year. A little bit more. Uh, yeah. Is 2018 uh, a sort of normal year for the Nordics? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, maybe it was a hot winter, a cold winter, a regular winter, an average winter. But uh, if you pick up uh, 18 and not 19 or 17 or 16 or whatsoever uh, oh. year you select in the last five years, you should qualify it a bit because if it was uh, a structurally uh, low price year, then your result are earned yeah. mine, or if it was a year with high prices, blah, blah, blah. So you have to give us a sort of statistical something uh, to, to, to show us that mm -hmm. this full year is representative of the realities uh, that you want to capture and it's not, it, it not introduce a bias uh, at the entry of the model. Yeah, in, in principle, we, 
Yeah, in principle, we can also extend the, the right time range we look at because there is the data. Uh, the only problem there is that the results become very massive. But uh, I agree that we could just as well quantify, explain the, the year selection. And thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation, a nice discussion. So I'm perfectly happy. Yeah, so let, let's go for the, for the second uh, paper. <coughs> Okay, so I think Sorry. that's me. Uh, so, uh, a very good morning to everybody in this and the session from my side. For those of you who do not uh, know me yet, my name is Ksenia Pavlovska, and I've been uh, working at uh, AIT, Austrian Institute of Technology, uh, for the last five years as research engineer in electricity markets uh, analysis and the uh, regulation of the electricity sector. And in parallel, I'm finalizing my PhD at TU Delft in the Netherlands. And today I'm going to present you some of the, uh, some of the results um, that I obtained uh, throughout my uh, PhD. Let me share the screen uh, with you. Please let me know that you can actually see it. And then we can start. Uh, yes, it's not in presenter mode, but uh, we can see it. Oh, great, thanks. All great. right, good. <laughs> All right, then let me start. And uh, so today we already discussed a little bit about the day ahead market. Uh, I'm going to transport you to uh, another uh, type of electricity markets, namely the balancing market. And we'll talk to you today about the effect of voluntary bids on balancing market efficiency. Um, so first I will give you a very brief overview of the balancing market and uh, the main uh, changes that were crucial for this uh, analysis, the current issues with the um, uh, balancing market that underpin um, our motivation for this for the study, the research question and the method we applied. I will uh, briefly introduce um, my model ELBA ABM to you. So this is the model that, um, that I used to um, produce the results. And after um, giving you some uh, overview of the results, I will conclude. So let's look at the uh, let's look at the market structure for a moment. Um, the main takeaway from uh, this picture really is that um, in the current um, in the current setting, we have a, num a number of electricity markets and ancillary services markets that fulfill different goals from, uh, let's say, starting with price hedging to uh, portfolio optimization in the day ahead market, what uh, Tim mentioned earlier, um, management of forecast errors. Um, and the place of the balancing uh, market has so far uh, been before the um, day ahead uh, market time frame, or more specifically between, before the gate closure time of the day ahead market. And um, uh, this is the market where uh, so far balancing capacity and energy been procured uh, together, which means that um, the first the uh, uh, balancing capacity is getting reserved ahead of time and uh, then it can possibly be activated in real time um, due to frequency deviations from the standard value of 50 Hertz. And the usual, let's say, sus suspects in the balancing market are, uh, for example, such technologies as hydropower, uh, gas turbines, and um, um, partially coal, depending on the balancing product. These uh, market participants, of course, also take part in the forward markets and in the different uh, European power exchanges, such as Epic Spot and Nord Pool. And what we have uh, um, had so far is the procurement of uh, balancing capacity and energy in a single auction, whereas uh, the uh, balancing markets are largely national, even though some bilateral or multilateral um, international corporations exist, it's still um, to a large extent, uh, extent a national uh, matter. So this is the situation, uh, situation prior to the adoption of the uh, EBGL, so, so, so the electricity balancing guideline, the regulation that needs to be uh, um, implemented by all uh, TSOs in the NCOE area. And what we see um, is um, a number of really important uh, market 
a balancing market adjustments. So uh, the main reasoning for those adjustments was really to open up the balancing market to a wider range of participants, as you can see here. Uh, for example, operators of storage units, so renewables, of course, and demand response. And um, an important feature of this new design is that the balancing capacity and energy will now be uh, uh, procured separately from each other in separate auctions, and the energy will be procured over cross-border platforms. Uh, I'm sure you already heard about um, the uh, platforms uh, Picasso, Mari, and Terra. Um, so one platform per balancing product that will be clearing close to close to real time. So really allowing um, um, also smaller participants or uh, participants with more value, variable portfolios to take part in the market. But this is not all. What is also into interesting is that now market participants would have two options. The first option would be to, as, as before, participate first in the balancing capacity market and uh, submit their um, capacity bid there. And if awarded, um, they are balancing energy bid in the uh, balancing energy market close to real time. An important uh, adjustment to the balancing energy market would be uh, the authorization of voluntary bids. So those uh, bids that can be submitted on the cross-border platforms and were not previously committed in the balancing capacity market. So let's imagine, a, uh, for example, an operator of a pool of uh, wind turbines that has a short-term flexibility based on the most updated forecast. And so they still have a possibility close to real time to submit that balancing energy bid to this market. What are the current issues? The current issues, uh, one I already, uh, let's say, indicated uh, the fact that so far balancing markets in all uh, EU countries have been highly concentrated. If we look at the number of pre-qualified participants in even the biggest um, uh, markets, let's take, for example, Germany, then depending on a product, even now, um, we will see that uh, the number of pre-qualified uh, balancing service providers will vary between 15 and 30 something, which is uh, arguably not that much considering the fact that not all of them obviously place their bids in, um, in every bidding period. As a result, uh, the actual participation per bidding period will be even, even lower than that. And so um, one of the main culprits, let's say, for the situation are strict pre-qualification requirements, but also what I call uh, legacy market designs, i.e. those market designs that have been um, created with those big um, traditional generators in mind. Um, at the same time, uh, new technologies such as renewables have faced a bigger challenge in committing their flexible capacity ahead of time. And this is why the possibility that is now provided by the electricity balancing guideline to submit voluntary bids is beneficial for new participants, both because day ahead market results are already known. So as you can see here, the balancing energy market closes after the day ahead market and after the cross-border intraday market. And at the same time, they can minimize their forecast errors, ergo provide more flexibility in this manner, uh, because otherwise they would have to be uh, have to um, assume a much more conservative bidding strategy. Uh, which led us to the uh, following main questions. So uh, we wanted to understand what would be the uh, impact of introducing voluntary bidders in the balancing energy market for um, um, for AFR, so um, automatic frequency restoration reserve on market efficiency. Um, we considered, for example, um, participants with or new actors with uh, portfolios of uh, wind. And how high the potential for strategic bidding is in uh, the market um, under two conditions. First condition under PS bid or marginal pricing and um, considering that there are uh, no or some voluntary bidders participating in the market. 
Um, for this, we implemented um, the ELBA ABM uh, modeling framework. So this is an agent-based model of uh, electricity balancing that uh, uses uh, agent-based approach to, um, let's say, replicate market agent interaction. And it is complemented with reinforcement learning to uh, specifically answer that second question on the potential of strategic bidding. So uh, for that, we, inter we uh, implemented a two uh, step market with uh, so balancing capacity market and balancing energy market with different uh, clearing times and bidding frequencies, and at the same time um, provided uh, strategic bidders with um, a fitted Q iteration algorithm that has been implemented in, in Python using uh, scikit-learn uh, library in order to um, understand to which extent would they will be able to maximize their profits under different market designs and uh, market landscape. A quick word about uh, LBABM. As you can see um, on this on this diagram, like I said, is a is a two step is a two step uh, model modeling both balancing capacity and energy markets. Also, it uh, includes uh, both uh, auctions for uh, upward and downward regulations uh, cleared uh, separately, as is, um, as is done in the actual markets. We took as, a, as an example uh, to consider the uh, uh, Austrian-German AFR market, um, Austrian-German since they have the same, uh, the same market design. And uh, these uh, markets have a combined, so far have had, it changed uh, only recently, uh, last December. But uh, before that, they had a combined balancing capacity and energy market without any possibility to submit voluntary bids. And they used uh, pay as bid pricing in uh, the balancing, for balancing energy. Uh, we compared that to the market design that is required by the uh, European balancing guideline, which uh, requires the introduction of a standalone balancing energy market, the introduction of voluntary bidding, and application of uh, marginal pricing to um, the uh, balancing energy uh, clearing. What we have in the model are um, balancing service providers with different types of uh, strategies, which can be a, a, a true cost, so ba uh, bidding their um, true opportunity costs or uh, variable costs, um, rule-based strategies, and the strategic bidding, as I said, implemented with uh, as reinforcement learning that uh, is aimed at maximizing long-term discounted profits in all markets, uh, all markets, meaning uh, the agent's participation is both the auction for upward and also downward regulation and in the capacity and energy markets. Uh, these strategies can be defined per agent and have been defined per agent. Um, each agent has a, a portfolio of uh, several generators and they can decide both on the bid price and bid volume, which creates a fairly large um, action space um, in, in our case. So the model uh, or the agent um, evaluates about 20,000 combinations per time step. So per time step would, would be either an hour for balancing capacity market or 15 minutes for the balancing energy market. Um, I know it's been a lot of information, but so for the those of you who are interested in this um, in this type of a model, I would also like to invite you to take a look at the uh, some more model results that have been published in Applied Energy, and also those ones that have been um, let's say replicated in a different context of the Swedish FCRN market. The report is also available. The link to the report is available here on the slide. Now let's look at the results. The most uh, the exciting part. Um, I uh, decided to show just um, in, ter in terms of the uh, bid duration curves, I decided to show you uh, this one as the most, let's say, representative one. And this uh, uh, bid duration curve, um, sorry, is a uh, market uh, price duration curve represents the uh, a positive balancing energy auction. And the scenarios that we compared were the scenarios with uh, um, uh, a perfectly competitive one. So with true cost bidders only. Uh, this is the purple curve on the right-hand side. Uh, and then uh, two scenarios with strategic bidders. These are the, the green curve and the red curve. 
with the two different pricing rules, pay as bid and uh, marginal pricing. And finally, um, two more scenarios where uh, a single into a single voluntary bidder with a portfolio of uh, wind generation was added to the market. And what we see is that, um, and I think this is very evident from the graph, is that the strategic bidders that are present in the market um, create um, a fairly non-competitive situation where the, uh, uh, the, the prices exceed the competitive outcome by a factor of four in uh, a case of marginal pricing and even seven um, in case of pay as bid. However, the situation dramatically changes if we introduce voluntary bids. And even though we keep that oligopolistic setting, Still, the balancing prices um, in these results approximate um, a perfectly competitive scenario. So the, the purple curve um, here on the, on the right-hand side. And what you see here is that although they can still deviate from the competitive scenario, they uh, deviate from their true costs only about 25 to 30% of the times which are uh, correlated with the, scar with the scarcity events in the market. At the same time, um, what is very important to consider is that based on the results of the model, the, uh, that voluntary bidder actually induces more competitive behavior, i.e. Uh, the voluntary bidder, also based on its uh, variable size, uh, since the, um, the availability of wind is, is uh, variable, um, does not just push, let's say, incumbents out of the market, but importantly, makes them uh, bid closer to their, to their true costs. In particular, this is seen when marginal pricing is applied. And what is also important to consider that we did not assume that the voluntary bidder would necessarily bid low. So um, we also considered uh, the fact that uh, they would not necessarily bid their true costs, which are net, uh, near zero for, um, uh, for wind, but rather uh, bid, for example, the difference between the marginal price and their uh, variable costs. And uh, what we see also is that um, since we were comparing um, pay as bid and marginal pricing, that we see that marginal pricing does indeed lead to more um, to highest efficiency gains, regardless of whether we're talking about an, an oligopoly with a lot of strategic bidders, or we're talking about a more competitive mar market with volunteer bidders. What you can also see here um, is the effect on the balancing capacity market, because obviously it is, um, it is um, uh, the uh, balancing service provider participating in the balancing market would consider um, his or her bids in the two market, which are the stages, let's say two stages of the same thing. And what we see um, here on the, on the left-hand side is that when there are no voluntary bids included in the scenarios, um, uh, strategic bidders tend to underbid their, uh, balancing, their true balancing capacity costs. The reason why they do that is in order to, let's say, get a foot in the door in the balancing energy market where they can um, get much higher profits that will in excess compensate the lost profits from the balancing capacity market. And this tendency pretty much disappears in the uh, situation where voluntary bidders are involved since, uh, as I will show you also on the next slide, balancing uh, the, the prices in the balancing energy market go uh, downwards substantially. So there's this uh, incentive, this original incentive is, is dampened in, um, in the scenario with uh, voluntary bidders. At the same time, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, the, the important thing is that voluntary bidders presence induces competitive behavior. And you can see it here on the right-hand side that in the balancing energy market, it is only about 20% of all times um, that a strategic bidder would deviate from their true costs compared to 45% of times in a scenario where no voluntary bids are present. 
Um, this, of course, just tells you about the frequency of the deviation, but not about the, the magnitude of the deviation. So in this uh, case, where no voluntary bidders are present, um, also the magnitude of deviation is higher. And here uh, we have a snapshot of the of the costs with the, in the scenarios with the all true cost bidders um, scenario where uh, both true cost and strategic bidders are present uh, and no voluntary bids are allowed. And finally, a scenario with um, strategic and true cost bidders plus um, a voluntary bidder with a portfolio of wind. And what we see here is that the prices um, and costs in the balancing capacity market do increase. Um, as I said before, the main reason for that is that there is barely any underbidding in the balancing capacity market. However, we can also see that the uh, uh, costs of the uh, balancing energy market get substantially reduced. And this uh, helps to compensate for increased prices in the uh, balancing um, capacity market. Uh, two minutes. Yes, I need only one to conclude. Good. Um, so to conclude, um, I would like to share with you the conclusions both based on the uh, um, market design analysis, but also some methodological conclusions. So on the content related side, what we see is that uh, the market changes that are proposed by the electricity balancing guideline do indeed create tangible efficiency gains in the balancing market, which is, I think, uh, very good news since this is where the market uh, now mandatorily going. Um, so it's good to, to know that it's going in the right side, in the right direction. At the same time, we see that the uh, presence of volunteer bidders greatly reduces the risk of strategic bidding, including by the incumbents. Um, an interesting point to consider is that if we look at the um, uh, dimensioning of balancing capacity, it is fairly limited. This is, uh, this is let's say, fairly obvious because uh, of the uh, fairly high reservation costs that in the end are, are getting socialized. But thanks to the fact that now voluntary bidders are allowed, the offer on balance of balancing energy is no longer constrained but that by that limited volume in the balancing capacity market. Um, we saw that in all scenarios, marginal pricing leads to more competitive bidding in all scenarios, and that all market participants are incentivized to bid to their, um, to their uh, true short-term variable costs. And on the uh, methodological side, what is, uh, what is uh, interesting is that we tested this methodology of combining ABM with reinforcement learning and saw that it is well suited to study um, actor strategies and market design changes uh, where uh, we do not need to assume perfect competition or perfect information of market actors. And um, at the same time that uh, this methodology allows us to evaluate the potential for strategic bidding in changing market conditions without, let's say, tempering, tempering with the market itself. That's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Xenia. Very <clears throat> interesting and stimulating talk, um, I would say, as usual. Um, so congratulations first. And now a round of question. And I assume there is a, a couple of them in, in the audience. So please switch on your camera and um, let's start the fireworks. Okay. I will raise the first one, uh, if you don't mind. Um, First, I think that your work is very interesting uh, uh, and uh, it seems to validate the strategy of the EU Commission, which is uh, strange because usually uh, as academics, <laughs> we like to say that uh, the road taken by the EU Commission is usually uh, not, the, not the first best, but at least the second or sometimes a third best. And it seems that uh, it was not the case this time. So. First, it's, uh, it seems to be a good news. 
the second uh, comment is uh, as I am coming from from a country where we have let's say a strange form of uh, market competition um, with uh, let's say one big competitor and uh, very few very small competitors mm -hmm. uh, I, I would rather um, uh, think about uh, uh, did you consider or can you can you consider this type of um, of let's say um, a regional uh, distribution of uh, of actors that can be different uh, across different zones and mm -hmm. maybe a strategic gaming uh, when the issue of congestion is uh, is taking place because um, uh, when there is no congestion we have one zone but when we have congestions uh, borders reappears and uh, strategic gaming could be different depending on uh -huh. the network, on the networks. Uh -huh. so is your uh, approach uh, able to catch what's going on in this type of, of configurations? Uh, thank you for an interesting uh, for an interesting question um, about congestion. As uh, you you know by now, I'm uh, in my PhD. I'm focusing both on the issues of balancing and congestion, and let's say the interactions between between the two. Um, I have to say that the model, uh, the way it is right now, does not consider uh, congestion explicitly or implicitly. But uh, this is indeed a very uh, interesting topic. Um, and the next step for the research, um, particularly if we consider those cross-border uh, balancing platforms. So the uh, availability of uh, capacity for the exchanges of balancing energies uh, and energy will definitely be a really important topic. And I think in that context, uh, context the uh, issue of congestion will uh, be even more important. So this is point one. Point two about your um, you mentioning uh, the French uh, market and having the big uh, one big supplier. So um, I had a uh, scenario. It's not included here uh, with uh, a single um, let's say a single dominant um, bidder. And there I would say that the unfortunate result is that smaller as long as that. Um, that market participant can cover the bulk of the uh, um, balancing energy market, then there is a high risk that uh, smaller new providers really remain on the competition fringe. So I think you raised also an important uh, question about the, um, let's say, actor landscape in the balancing market, because indeed the results would then be um, different if you consider uh, this type of, uh, let's say, a monopolistic position of one actor. Um, I would, in this context, I also would like to bring up some uh, some insights that we can gain from analyzing, for example, the Swedish balancing market, which has um, um, a situation that is similar in a sense that they have they don't have a monopoly of a single balancing provider, but they have, let's say, the monopoly of a single. Uh, balancing service providing technology, namely hydro. And as a result, uh, what we uh, what we saw is that um, we saw a little bit of a disturbing trend that in the current market conditions, uh, some other participants from other countries tried instead of um, um, bidding what they should be bidding in a competitive market, they were just trying to emulate the strategy of hydro bidders. So you have this kind of a mimicry behavior when you have such a monopoly of a single technology, which we found very interesting. And we also found out that in order to really dilute this market, a really uh, high share, for example, of pre-qualified wind generation would be necessary to, let's say, um, move them into a more, um, towards a more competitive behavior. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, very clear answers, uh, Xenia. Is there any other questions in, uh, in the audience? Uh, yes, I have questions. Yes, please. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it in this case, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, have you considered exchanges in this model? With other you mean the cross-border exchanges? Yeah. 
No, um, as I was mentioning to uh, Professor, that I'm not uh, I'm not considering cross border exchanges at this uh, stage yet. Uh, this will be the next uh, the next uh, point in the in our investigation, considering the uh, the cross border balancing platforms where this kind of exchanges will be much much more relevant. Because as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, presentation, right now um, uh, balancing markets are still a very much of a national topic and this is why cross-border exchanges for this specific market are not that uh relevant but definitely will be in the future okay thank you and uh, i have another question if there is some time left um i would like to know concerning the strategic bidders mm -hmm. in the way that you represented did you apply something that will influence the results that you obtain? I mean, the, the fact to, to underbid in the capacity market mm -hmm. and after to, to bid very high uh, reserve energy prices. Is there something that um, led to this result or is it uh, natural? Uh, yes, there is something that uh, led to this result and thank you very much for this, uh, for this question. Um, since I had limited time, I didn't get into the into the detail of the implementation of the reinforcement learning agent. But I think what is really um, interesting about it is that this kind of uh, behavior was um, was possible to replicate thanks to um, modeling um, a single a bouncing service provider as two collaborating reinforcement learning agents. So you have one in the balancing capacity market and another one in the balancing energy market. And thanks to the fact that they exchange information on their, let's say, success in both markets and they share the total profits from all the, uh, uh, so the positive and negative auction and from balancing capacity and balancing energy, in the end, they managed to identify this as a dominant strategy to underbid in the balancing capacity to get compensated in balancing energy which means that if I did not have that sort of collaboration in the model, that result would not have been possible to achieve. Okay, but uh, yeah, it's interesting because it's something that has been uh, highlighted in, in, uh, in market reports. And so mm -hmm. your model are able to, to give the same results. So it's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I see there is another, another question from uh, Christoph. Yes. Yes, exactly. So thank you also from my side. Um, if I understood you correctly, um, you, your results showed that uh, once voluntary bids are introduced, um, costs are decreasing and uh, it becomes more efficient. Um, so I was wondering after the introduction of voluntary bids in Germany, this is not really what we have seen, right? So do you have any explanation for that? I mean, your results stand perfectly in line with what we would expect from a theoretic perspective, but somehow it doesn't seem to work out in Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question. I was hoping that someone will bring up the German case since I'm following the situation in Germany fairly closely, being our closest neighbor, uh, neighbor here in, uh, in Austria. Um, I even wrote an article uh, about it called the, the German balancing energy conundrum. Um, that uh, specifically addresses this uh, situation. I'd say uh, first I was fairly puzzled by what happened, but then uh, there are two things that, um, that I realized uh, based on the, um, uh, some additional model results and based on the uh, uh, analysis of, for example, the Swedish market. Two points. First point is that um, if you think about it from a purely uh, market participant perspective, this is a huge change for the uh, market participants in Germany. And any type of big change uh, creates, uh, if you look at the empirical results, always creates some sort of price shocks. And I think that kind of a, situations, a situation where the uh, market participants really started um, to a certain extent fairly aggressively, let's say testing the market and uh, seeing what they really can achieve there, um, is fairly evident. And I think there it is really a, a high factor um, creating uh, those exorbitant um, bouncing energy prices that ultimately led uh, Bundesnetzagentur to uh, introduce um, um, a price cap in the bouncing energy market. 
But there is another point, um, and that other point is um, the um, the possibility of what I call a uh, second chance bidding. What does that mean? That means that if we consider volunteer bids that I used in this model, then these will be only, let's say, balancing service providers external to the market. So they did not have anything to do with the balancing capacity market in the first place. They just entered when there was a short term flexibility. That's it. But if um, technically, if this kind of uh, bidding is allowed, then if I'm an incumbent, I can still use this possibility if my bid did not get awarded in the balancing capacity market. And I use this, let's say, second opportunity as a second chance to still get something from the balancing energy market. And this, in this kind of situation, I run some simulations there as well. If we have a situation where um, volunteer bidding is allowed, but there are no real voluntary bidders or not a critical mass of voluntary bidders, the new ones from the market, but it's just the same old folks, just uh, let's say using it as a second chance, then you didn't really improve anything in the market. You just decoupled balancing capacity and balancing energy market because A, there is no reason for them to um, underbid and balancing capacity market anymore because they can still enter later. And B, uh, due to the fact that their competition did not really increase in the balancing capacity in the balancing energy market, they can still bid really high. And I think those are, um, I wouldn't uh, necessarily say that these are the only factors, but I do believe that based on the simulation results, these would be um, some of the reasons why what happened in Germany did happen. Thank okay, you. very interesting. Thank you. For your uh, answers, uh, okay. we are going to, to to move to the the last presentation. But I, I think you deserve a round of applause for both the presentation and the answer to questions. Congrats! Thank you very much. And now we move to the last <clears throat> speaker of this uh, this session, uh, which is uh, Marie. Yeah. Hi. Is Marie mm -hmm. or is yours? Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, but not in full screen yet. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to present the first article that I've been working on as part of my PhD. So it's called Assessment of Short-Term Congestion Management Techniques, Most Suited to Near Real-Time European Balancing Platform. And as you can see among the... Um, it's a collaboration between the French GSO RTE and uh, Central Tibet uh, with Yannick uh, collaborating. Uh, so to give a bit of context, so as you probably all know, um, uh, an important role in the electricity network is to have a supply demand balance and it's reflected in the frequency of uh, the power. Um, and so when the frequency deviates, uh, you use balancing. Um, and so there are four different balancing products defined by ENSOE. The quickest one being the frequency containment reserve, which turns on in a second and is, of course, automatic. And then we have the frequency restoration reserve. Part of it is automatic and part of it is manual. And finally, we have the replacement reserve, which is the slowest one, and it turns on in 30 minutes. And so in this paper, uh, we're only going to focus on the manual balancing product, so the MFRR and the RR. Um, so why are we looking at the MFRR? We're well, mostly the managed uh, control zone by control zone, and um, there are two new projects underway, uh, Ter and Marie, which aim to integrate manual balancing products to have one uh, European ma market coupling. So uh, the TER project is for the RR market and it will clear 30 minutes before real time. And then the MARI project is for the MFRR market and it will clear 15 minutes before real time. Uh, so this has, uh, this implies major changes. I'm not going to describe everything, but these are three of the major changes. Um, so, the, the first one is for the transmission system operator. So at least in France today, uh, the transmission system operator can choose which bids he wants to activate for balancing and when. Whereas um, with these new platforms, 
the TSO will have to, in priority, activate bids that were selected by Terra Marine Markets. Uh, there's, there's a question of bid formats. So again, once again, uh, in France today, the TSO accepts very varied structures for the bids, uh, whereas with Terra and Marie, the bids will have to be uh, standard in priority. And the last point is that they, the, the activation is done control zone per control zone, whereas with these new platforms, uh, the bids will all be shared into one merit order list and the activation will be centralized. Uh, so we, if we have a quick look into the Terre and Marie processes, um, so in green we have the Terre process, and so we can see that it starts one hour before real time and for every hour. Um, and so the, um, here the TSO has 15 minutes to compute its needs and to filter the bids. Um, and then the market takes 15 minutes to clear, and the, then the generators have 30 minutes to be at the right uh, point of power. Uh, and so that's pretty close to real time, but as we can see, Marie is even nearer to real time as the, the clearing takes place 10 minutes uh, before real time, and this for 15 minute time clocks. And another point is that it's not exactly the same uh, countries that take part in both projects. So for example, we can see that Germany takes part in Marie, but not in Terre. Uh, so, of course, uh, Terre and Marie have a lot of um, benefits. So, they are um, economically efficient and they could help uh, integrate renewable energy. But because they're very ambitious and new projects, they are also going to have an impact on congestion. And because um, they are so near real time, it, it's, the impact is going to be mainly on short term congestion. Uh, so we try to distinguish uh, or to explain how they were going to impact uh, congestion. So I distinguish two factors. The first one is that bids are going to be shared across Europe. And the second one is that the clearing is so near real time. And this has several consequences are uh, going to be shared across Europe means that there are going to be more ex exchanges and so uh, increased pressure on interconnections. And then the fact that the bids are shared makes, means that it's going to be more difficult for TSOs to predict the location of the activated bids. And given that not all internal constraints are uh, taken into account in the optimization, there's a risk of creating new congestion. And finally, um, Terre and Marie create some uncertainty because they're going to have an impact on the the outcome is going to have an impact on the network. And because they are so near real time, this uncertainty is very short term. And all of this in a context where renewable energies are already kind of shaking um, congestion management in Europe. So the conclusion of this is that Terre and Marie will change the way that we manage short term congestion. So this paper is part of the congestion management field. So I took, um, I used Irten Glissman's definition of congestion management, which is quite uh, wide. So um, congestion management is any measure undertaken by system operators, regulatory authorities, or lawmakers that aims at influencing power flows in accordance with operational security constraints. And so of course, congestion management is a field that's been very widely studied before. Um, but because um, Terre and Marie bring very new constraints, they create a non-precedented situation. And so the question that we're going to try to answer in this work is, which are the most adapted short-term congestion management techniques to deal with the new constraints imposed by Terre and Marie? And so I'll try to answer this question in four points. First, I'll review the congestion management techniques that are already included in the platforms. Then I present a review and classification of other existing techniques. I'll analyze the compatibility of these techniques with the Terre Marie constraints, and then I'll conclude. Uh, so for the current congestion management techniques that are included in Terre Marie, uh, there are four. The first one is filtering. Um, so before the market, it means that the transmission system operators allowed not to transfer a bid to the platform if they think that it's going to create congestion. Then there's the cross-border capacity. 
which represents synthetically how much power can be exchanged on a specific border without putting grid security at risk. And cross-border capacity is complemented by the interconnector controllability. Um, so here, the TSO can submit a desired flow range for the cross-border connection. So uh, it kind of complements the cross-border capacity, but um, the TSOs can ask for a specific value and they have to compensate. And finally, we have bid blockage, which takes place after the market. And uh, here, the transmission system operator uh, is allowed to reject a bid uh, returned by the optimization if they think that it's going to create congestion. So um, for the effect of these techniques for bid blockage filtering and interconnector controllability, it's definitely useful to avoid congestion, um, but they're not maybe the most efficient economically. And at least their optimal use should be uh, studied. And also what's important is the interaction among each other, which should be studied. And then there's the cross-border capacity computation, which is a, has a different problem. So um, the current methodology used to uh, compute this capacity is, uh, is quite inaccurate, actually. So there are two reasons for this. The first one is that the cross-border capacity is computed at 1 p.m. the day before, so way ahead of the balancing market. And this has two implications. The first one is that the network configuration will probably have changed between the moment when the capacity is computed and when it's used for the balancing markets. And the effect of this is that it could actually not be very relevant at the time of the balancing markets. And the second consequence has to do with remedial action. So um, when the operators compute the cross-border capacity, they take into account a remedial action. So remedial action can be is an action that's taken to um, avoid congestion. So it can be, for example, opening or closing a line. And so when the operators compute this capacity way ahead of real time, they, they uh, consider that they have as much time as they want to apply these remedial actions. But when you're at the outcome of Terre and Marie like 10 minutes before real time, you're not going to ha have the time to apply many remedial actions. So they're not properly taken into account in um, the computation. So the consequence of this is that the capacity is not very accurate and either it's going to be too wide and the system security will be at risk or um, it's going to be too small and the exchanges will be overly restricted. And um, this is actually aggravated by the fact that if the system security is at risk, uh, network operators have very little time to react because of the short time frames of Terrena. And an additional limit to the current capacity computation is that it uses the ATC methodology, which was uh, traditionally used, um, but it has recently been shown to be suboptimal compared to uh, the flow-based method, which better takes into account network constraints and is actually already used in the um, day ahead market. So we think it would be interesting to apply the flow-based uh, methodology for the balancing market. Um, so to conclude this part, uh, the methods that are included in the platforms are useful, but they should either um, be um, um, improved or um, to make the whole solution more optimal, it would be interesting to complement them with other existing congestion management techniques. So that's what I'm going to try to understand in the rest of this presentation, which other existing congestion management techniques um, would be useful and uh, relevant for Terre and Marie. So um, to, to list the different techniques that existed, I want to um, use an existing congestion management review. So I looked at different uh, reviews that we have here. And so I wanted a review that was adapted to the European context, given uh, the issue of Terre and Marie. And these are the ones that are cycled in green. And uh, among these reviews, I chose the most recent because it was important that the review be up to date with the technology and with the regulation. So uh, uh, I selected Irten Gliesman's um, uh, congestion management review. 
Uh, so I um, I used all the methods that were included in IRT and Gleesman's uh, congestion management review, and I added a few. And I wanted to classify these methods in a way that was adapted to the Terre and Marie constraints. And because the timeframes of Terre and Marie is such a, an important constraint, I uh, we developed a, a classification that was adapted to um, the Terre and Marie timeframes. So the first level of classification was to separate operational methods from long-term methods, because um, and so long-term methods uh, includes, for example, network reinforcement, and so um, it's definitely useful to to alleviate congestion. But when you're ten minutes uh, before real time, it's not applicable. So um, I'm not going to further analyze them in this paper, and then. And we have operational methods. Um, and so the second level of classification, I wanted to um, distinguish the position of methods uh, compared to uh, the market clearing. So we have pre-market methods, market-based methods, and post-market methods, uh, which means real-time congestion alleviation. And a second distinction that we made is um, we wanted to distinguish the methods that were easily implementable from the methods that would take a long time to implement. And the criteria, the criterion that we use to uh, separate the methods that would take a long time um, to implement is, the, is um, whether the method requires major regulatory changes or not. And um, so we estimated that um, these methods were nodal representation, bidding zone configuration, locational order books and flexibility markets. And so um, I'm not saying that they are not useful, they could be very useful. Um, but, but since uh, Terre is already live and Marie is supposed to go live in 2022, they're not going to be um, available for the first versions of Terre Marie. So in the rest of the presentation, I'm going to look at the methods that are not yet included in Terre Marie and that don't require major regulatory changes. And try to understand if they're compatible with Terre Marie or not. So in pre-market methods, we have cross-zonal capacity allocation, um, which means that you reserve part of the cross-border capacity for balancing. And one of the results of this is that the network is less congested before Terre Marie starts to run. And the benefit is that it's actually allowed by European regulation. And then we have market-based methods. So we already saw the cross-border capacity computation and nodal and bidding zone reconfiguration uh, require major regulatory changes. And finally, we have uh, post-market methods. So the first method is, of course, redispatching, uh, in which I include curtailment. So it's kind of the default congestion management methods. It, it can be quite expensive, so it can't be the only method in place. And another issue is that it's not politically acceptable to curtail renewables a lot, given that they are subsidized. The second interesting method is topological changes. Um, so recent work shows that it has a lot of potential, but as I pointed out earlier, um, topological changes are part of remedial actions, and they're not taken into account properly in the cross-border capacity computation. So uh, the next step for balancing would be to actually uh, properly take them into account in the cross-border capacity computation. And the last method that I want to look at is national balancing markets, which are still allowed. And um, in some countries, such as France, they are joint with redispatching markets. They, they can actually still be used to um, alleviate congestion. Um, but because the outcome of Terre Marie might have a strong impact on the network, it might not be interesting to actually activate any of these bids before we know the outcome of Terre Marie. So it never limits the, um, the scope. Um, so that's it. So for the conclusion, I have uh, two main points. The first is that the, we should better integrate network constraints in the Terre Marie optimizations. So by this, I mean that the current cross-border capacity computation method uh, should be improved. So um, 
by improved, I think that the easiest solution on the short term would be to keep a zonal representation and improve the current methodology. So we see two key areas for, um, for improvement. The first one is to use a network representation uh, forecasted closer to real time, which would really reduce uncertainty. And the second one would uh, be to apply a flow-based methodology instead of the ATC, which would be more accurate. And uh, this position is actually backed by the European balancing guidelines that specify that TSO should develop a new methodology for cross-border uh, capacity computation for balancing by 2022. And um, my second point is that uh, it would be interesting to complement the current process with other solutions. So the best overall solution is, to, uh, is probably to combine several of the methods described. And so uh, this is what I'm going to try to do in the rest of my PhD. Uh, so we're going to try to evaluate the impact of Terre and Marie on short-term congestion. And we want to uh, test it with different congestion management techniques and different um, um, configurations of congestion management techniques because the interaction of these techniques among each other is uh, very important too. So because we can't look at everything, we want to start uh, to, with the methods that are put forward by national and European regulation. And so these methods are the improved capacity calculation, the cross zonal capacity allocation, redispatching, uh, topological changes, and the methods that are already included in the platforms. So that's all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marie. And uh, <clears throat> as you end up with one minute uh, before the schedule, we have uh, 13 minutes for discussion. So of course, I will not raise any question for the presentation of Marie, because I have plenty of time to raise many questions to her <clears throat> on meetings. So, uh, Nicola, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thanks. For, uh, sorry for the background now. Uh, thanks, Marie. Very, very interesting presentation. Uh, although it's, it's a very difficult topic and you made it very clear. So thanks a lot for uh, having us catching up with what's happening on, on this front because it's very hard to follow. Um, <laughs> I just have, uh, well, I, because I, I mean, like, I kind of find it's interesting that we put so much energy in, in creating this platform and, and still came at central dispatches. Difficult or too complicated. But anyway, uh, two clarification question. Um, so, so you, you did talk a little bit about um, redispatch and and congestion management techniques that already um, exist, but I, I still don't get how that would because MFFR ends ten minutes before your time. So, in in a country, let's say Italy, that's um, kind of dispatch in real time based on a, on an OPF or like a central dispatch kind of model. Isn't there a risk that in these countries you would actually end up being worse because having the constraint to, to build on this central uh, platform without any network issue? Uh, and then, I mean, I, 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 I don't get how you articulate uh, Mari with um, uh, redispatching in a country like Italy that already has some kind of uh, network optimization in your plan and deal with that. And, and the second question, which is more like regulatory. Um, how, how does this reservation of cross border capacity plays out with um, this like 70% pool to basically try to maximize how much interconnector capacity is available in their head? And at the same time, you want to reserve them for reserve. So, uh, how would that play out together? Um, okay, thank you. That's actually a really interesting question. Um, I didn't know that uh, if you had a real time. Uh, congestion management. Uh, it's, it's more to the same yeah. activation. They kind of have some, uh, they do have some kind of new model to decide which uh, plans to run in, in real time. Uh, but then they have tons of like in, intraday markets. So, it, but uh, I guess like uh, some countries in this pool have some kind of network model to decide on which, I mean, even RT in the meetings uh, just among you, they have some um, activation for congestion, which is in the R domain. And this would wouldn't fit in the platform as as far as I understood it because the platform. Uh, no, yeah. So 
I mean, assuming that activation, activation for congestion in R was efficient before, and now you exclude it because it's not in the platform, and um, uh, how would that play out? And is there a risk that we may end up in a worse outcome with the platform in these kind of situations? Yeah, so what, from what I understand, it's a, they, they can't activate a bid now in the platforms for congestion reasons. Um, so they'll have to do probably either their redispatch afterwards. That's what I understood. Um, but it might be very short to redispatch. So um, one of the solutions, for example, is uh, to do some preventive redispatch. And that's also why they have to filter the bids beforehand. Um, or they or they can uh, reject bids. They think that it's going to create congestion. Uh, but yes, yeah, so redispatch can be the only solution. I'm not sure that answers the question. But... I mean, I don't expect a, an answer. I'm just ah, trying okay. to understand, and I'd be curious <laughs> some point of your opinion on it because I, I still don't get how they would articulate because uh, real time network constraint with a, a kind of zonal dispatch that ends up 10 minutes before real time. It's kind of like uh, switching my mind a little bit, but I'm sure they figure it something else. <laughs> So yeah. we have questions for Tim and from Xenia. So Tim, you raise your hand first and then after Xenia. Yes, thank you, Marie. Very interesting and clear presentation about an extremely difficult ongoing topic, which I'm following quite closely. Um, so, I mean, I have several points. They are not really questions, more like my own doubts uh, about what is going on in, in, in these platforms, which are an extremely ambitious project, but uh, of course not obvious to implement. About this filtering by individual TSOs, I think we, we cannot be naive. I think there will be sure issues with TSOs withholding bids because it's probably cheaper to use them for their own markets and, and they will claim it's because of operational security, but that's not necessarily true. So maybe I wonder what kind of checks and balances there will be to really figure out whether they are withholding bids for the right reasons or not. Uh, and that's also interacting with this, some do joint redispatch and balancing, others do not. So maybe you need to streamline that before you have these common balancing platforms. Another point about this reservation of cross-border capacity for balancing, um, I think there are already quite a bit of things going on in the Nordics where they really wanted to get it done, but there's also a lot of opposition from market parties because they don't like TSOs to decide on in which market frame or they see it as keeping it for themselves at the end instead of giving it to the market before. Um, and then, okay, one option would be to, and that's extremely, I would say, against what Xenia said, is to do a co-optimization of day ahead and balancing and everything one day before, because then you know who will produce, you know who's there for balancing, you know how the network will be, and you might not have these kind of problems. But then, of course, you have all the other problems that you don't allow close to real time, voluntary kind of market. So it, it's also a, uh, another issue. And my conclusion is, is would be that if you would solve it in a kind of a nodal way, you would don't have to deal with all this mess. But <laughs> As you said, that this would be an incredible uh, change in regulation. So probably not really for the short run, but it might be a conclusion for the longer run. That would um, be it. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, the filtering question is interesting because they, they are testing out some solutions actually, and the, the result was that they filtered like all the bids maybe. So uh, I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge. And um, they, they might have to find um, a, a, the right balance between filtering before and actually uh, rejecting some bids afterwards. Uh, because when you reject, of course, there's less uncertainty. And so um, like you can be a bit more flexible in the filtering. So yeah, I think that's actually uh, quite a, a big question um, uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, for the co-optimization, that's actually what I wanted to um, to try in the next part of a, um, of my studies. Uh, but yeah, there's the question of um, it's very ahead of real time, so I'm not sure. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, and it feeds directly into the discussion. So keep on going. <laughs> 
<clears throat> Thank you, Tim, for, uh, for the points. Uh, Xenia, I, I, I see you smiling, so I think that's your answer. <laughs> uh, I think that was a very good, uh, <laughs> I'd say, encouragement uh, statement from Tim. Keep at it, <laughs> keep going, because it's definitely a very, very complicated uh, topic with so many layers. So definitely you will get some some really exciting results. Really looking forward to, to seeing the quantitative uh, quantitative ones. Uh, but yeah, we'll be tough. <laughs> um, I already asked you a lot of questions in the past. So what I would rather uh, like to do is uh, to get you to, let's say, ponder on a scenario, uh, let's say on a what if scenario. So uh, Tim already mentioned that um, as a fourth point that uh, because of this uh, possibility to technically use uh, balancing bids for something else, like for redispatch, which is also the current practice now in the in the uh, uh, French uh, MFR market, um, there might be quite a bit of an incentive to do this pre-filtering, and so yeah, there will be. It's a little bit difficult to let's say control the TSOs um, in that regard and see how much they're really doing that, and for what reason. Um, do you, let's say, theoretically, or, or would you theoretically support a change that would allow uh, TSOs to activate uh, balancing and redispatch in the same platform? Do you think that would actually be more efficient if instead of them having or being constrained, let's say nationally to uh, do this filtering in advance, that they could say, okay, I can procure both things. Uh, these things are then co-optimized. And uh, do you think that would lead to a more efficient result as a hypothetical situation? I'm really not a specialist, but I think it would lead to a lot of gaming, uh, maybe. Um, and maybe I would trust the TSO more than, uh, but I'm a bit biased, more than uh, the actors. Um, but um, yeah. <laughs> but the gaming, in what way would there be gaming in that in that case? Um, uh, it's kind of a tough question, but um, well, I guess one of the problems if you um, put um, redispatching in it is that uh, I would guess that the countries would mainly activate bids that are in their area. Like it, mm. would, um, it would kind of diminish the effect of, the, of sharing bids across Europe and the whole uh, economic uh, benefits. Um, so it depends, how, I think, how big the congestion management issues are going to be, like if it's worth it or not. And I'm not sure that we know that yet. No, this is why I said it's a it's a hypothetical question, but I think it would be interesting to to really know whether there is a because there is a big question about the whole or what also Tim mentioned about co optimization. It's also the question of what it is that you want to co optimize, whether you want to co optimize different balancing products or between balancing and redispatch or between uh, let's say redispatch and day ahead or everything like central dispatch. Um, so I think that would be really interesting to really see. Because for now, what I've seen is a lot of speculation, but there's a very little uh, actual like quantitative uh, assessment of that. So I think that would be really exciting to find out. I think that's a good, uh, good point. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Okay, we have one minute to conclude, so I would like to uh, use this minute to uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming and uh, having this very lively discussion. Um, and, um, and I think we all know now enough to uh, keep on interacting by uh, emails, Zooms, Teams, uh, whatsoever, the media, uh, and I hope that we will uh, keep on interacting on any type of uh, information channels. I see my host uh, saying that we have to, to give up and uh, I would uh, ask for a round of applause before uh, quitting the, um, the room. Bye-bye guys and see you in the next uh, 
events of the day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.